Steve, man, how are you? Fantastic. How are you? You need oh, a mic. Sorry, just pull a mic. Yeah, up. I need a mic. Need a get a like. Your voice is loud, now. but it's not that loud. A fist in. Do you want me to come sort it? Oh, there you go. Yeah, you're good. Am I good? Yeah, just a little bit closer. A little bit closer. Let's go. You can manage it all. That's what she said. There we go. <laughs> good to see you, man. Good to see you. I've, it's been too long. Last time I saw you was um, we had a Sunday roast. We had a Sunday roast together in London we, um, with the kiddos. What's it called? Um, Hawksmoor. No, we went to. Um, it was Gordon Ramsay's. Gordon Ramsay's place, place oh, for, nice. a Sunday, for a British Sunday roast. Oh man, very civilized. My my kids who are not civilized at all, they they live for Sunday roast in the UK. Uh, well, our food gets a lot of criticism, but the Sunday roast is killer. Oh, you can't good, wait. You have cool kids, by the way. Oh, thank you. You have cool kids too. Yeah, they all just sat there being quiet, playing with their phone. <laughs> Staring at each other. Yeah. Uh, no, it was good to see you, man. It was before, like, everything went to shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it was... No, I think things had started going to shit. Have I think, they? I think... Didn't Celsius go down at that point in time? Do you see the New York AG announced today they're suing them? Yes. Suing Mashinsky? Yes. Huh. I mean, those are some really interesting articles that came out about Celsius in the last few days. I've not followed. I mean, we've been like we've been here for three days making shows. I don't know what I've missed, but uh, Mashinsky's an interesting one. I've had bad vibes from him for a long time. Same. Uh, I met him in uh, Hong Kong hmm. at the uh, Token Twenty Forty Nine um, conference. Uh, interestingly, Justin was there. Yeah, with a whole entourage. Um, met him for the first time. Met a bunch of people for the first time there, but uh, I met Mashinsky these really bad vibes from him and I've had them ever since uh, and I wasn't surprised when I found there was an issue with Celsius I was surprised that so much other shit happened but update me on Celsius then so all the um, the client deposits yeah. per the documents don't belong to the clients they belong to Celsius and the estate so whatever they have because there's like a there's a gap between what they have and what what their liabilities are, right? That's right. But so it looks like all of client deposits will go to paying off liabilities first, potentially potentially shareholders second, and depositors last. Holy shit. That's not good. And the, like help me understand, because this isn't like a UK thing. We don't have like the Bedford Attorney General suing Pete McCormack for lying to people about this football club, right? We don't have these kind of like state attorney generals. Is it a state or city attorney general? Well, you've got, well, you've got attorney generals of the U.S., of the state, of dis different districts, of, of, of cities. But, but this one in particular is being, um, is, is being tried in New York. State or city? Um, I believe it was a state attorney general okay. that came out to, uh, to sue Mashinsky. Actually, I don't even know what an attorney general is, to be honest. It's it's essentially the um, it's it's the the lawyer that represents that particular jurisdiction, right? You know, and so they're suing Mashinsky directly. Yes. For what reason? Because they want to uh, return as much net worth as he has to depositors on behalf of depositors, or because they want to put him in jail, or both. I think it's a combination of both. Um, it it looked like, and I'm, you know, I read the article very briefly. They're suing him for fraud, yeah, which means that they can go after his net worth, but they can also go after triple damages, right? So they can take anything he's taken times three, so they can essentially wipe him out and go to jail. What I find really interesting about this last few months, what I can't wrap my brain around is. Why people who are essentially successful, relatively wealthy compared to a lot of other people, have been so reckless that they've risked bankrupting themselves, uh, risked destroying their reputation, risked destroying the lives of themselves and their family for what appears to be like pure greed. Because, I mean, I never liked Celsius, but I think they could have built a fairly solid business without t being reckless. Similar to across, yeah, we've listed here, we've got a few here, 3AC, BlockFi, I mean, FTX is another one. 
if they'd have been responsible and not reckless, I feel like they could have built a big successful business. I just don't understand what these people are fucking doing. Well, I think there's I think there's two things going on here. Um, usually Ponzi schemes. Okay, let's let's just talk about those for a moment. Ponzi schemes don't start off as a Ponzi scheme. People don't say, oh, I'm going to go out and get people's money and then get the next guy's money and then give the first guy some of his money and I'm just going to keep doing this until it falls apart. That's, that's generally not what happens. Generally what happens is they're taking people's money in. They think they have a good idea. They start managing it. Something goes wrong and they don't want to upset their investors or they don't want everybody to pull out. So they're like, well, I'm going to kind of make an exception this time. Right. And they'll, they might do something like, you know, somebody wants a redemption and they, or, or they might pay out a dividend just to kind of keep everybody happy and keep everybody in so that they can make it up. Right. Like sometimes they have good intentions. I mean, I hate to call it good intentions, but like, well, I can, I can make up this hole. But as you keep trying to make up that hole, the hole gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's a certain personality, obviously, that, 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 that thinks that way. Right. So, that's usually how a Ponzi scheme evolves. They're like, well, if I can just keep it up a little bit longer, I can make up the hole. And, and that seems to be what had happened with, with FTX, right? It turned into a Ponzi scheme. I don't, I don't know. I mean, a lot of people say that, yeah, it was a fraud from the beginning. I don't know if that was the case. It, it could have been, but um, I truly believe that they had a hole that they kept trying to fill. And when you keep betting on black every time in the casino and you keep losing, eventually you think you're going to win, but you don't. Eventually, you're just wiped out. Yeah, I think something else went on with FTX in that uh, I saw the org chart of all the companies they bought and the structure of this organization, and they seem to have made a lot of investments. Um, uh, I know myself, I look back at my like career history, right? I built a very small advertising agency that got to like 35 people, and that was challenging, like really challenging. You know, and eventually that company failed. We lost a big spot, uh, sorry, big not sponsor, a big advertiser, and we had to shrink it, and eventually it failed. That was hard. Mm -hmm. Like this is my first podcast. Like we've been through ups and downs. It's hard, and this is a team of five people. I don't know Sam's full career history or the career history of everyone who was alongside him, but to build a company that fast and by that many companies. I, I feel like something ran away from them and they just also didn't know what the fuck they were doing. I mean, that, that's, that's very well possible. And I don't know if you've ever been around the whole Silicon Valley group, right? I mean, they try to pump things up very quickly. Yeah. And there was probably a lot of pressure to say, okay, well, we just gave you money. You should raise another round and we're going to bring in all of our friends and we're going to, you know, give you even more money at a higher valuation. And you've got to figure out ways to deploy that capital. You know, and I'm not saying that that's what happened, but it seems to be pretty close to what happened and then they just couldn't manage it. But going back to the second thing that, that happens, you know, that, that I think happened in all these cases is a lot of people wanted to create a marketplace, okay? Uh, Voyager, BlockFi, Celsius, FTX, they're all marketplaces. Marketplaces require two sides of the trade. There's people that are putting up their money to get, returns, you know, to get, to get yield. And then people that borrow and they have to pay a higher yield to borrow the money. Now it wasn't a true, true sided market. I mean, how many people do you out, out there, do you know, that was saying, Oh yeah, I'm going to go borrow money from Celsius and pay 15%. Yeah. It's very rare that you got the odd person here or there wants to borrow. Yeah. You know, maybe they're buying a house or I know it happens. I, I t I've tended to tend to find the kind of people who borrow against a Bitcoin is the kind of people who've got a shit ton of it. Yeah. You know, like I got a thousand Bitcoin, 500 Bitcoin, right? I'm going to borrow against like 50. And yeah, you know, maybe that that time is like a million, $2 million. And like yeah. it's a small amount of their Bitcoin net worth, but that $2 million allows them to buy a house and they know their Bitcoin's still there and they think the price is going $100,000. Like it's the, that's the trade that I, th I think. I don't think there's many. I could be wrong. I never felt like there's many people who want to borrow like a thousand dollars. That's right. But there's a lot of people who want to lend a thousand dollars. That's right. And get their interest. Point one Bitcoin, half a Bitcoin. So if there's not another side of that market, what do you do? You go out and find degenerates who are willing to borrow at a at a, at a certain rate, and you prop them up. I mean, 
you know, if you if you look at, you know, kind of go back to the list again, like Celsius or even Genesis, right? You got to find those people that are willing to take the loans. And who are the only two major counterparties that are willing to take the loans? Alameda, Three Arrows Capital. They were willing to take size loans to do a trade that they thought was never going to fail. I mean, look, we sat down last year and you called, you called the top. Oh, you called the top and I ignored you. You called the top, man. You said, yeah, I think it was November last year. Yeah. Yeah. You, and like, fine. I never thought, I never foresaw this kind of year coming where it was a combination of macro, uh, macro things happening that like uh, crushed the price because, uh, I mean, it was you was telling me how correlated Bitcoin is. Um, but then this kind of like collapse in the borrowing and lending market, like the two things hit it. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure if that shortened the, the bull market or I'm not sure if it deepened the bear market. I'm like, I'm looking to you and saying like, what's your crystal ball say? <laughs> Man, it's a tough one because, you know, I made that call based on macro events, yeah. right? And that's what I'm better at. Um, I didn't really expect, well, I, I, I'll take that back. I expected a couple of these lenders to fail. I expected potentially Celsius, potentially BlockFi. You know, I didn't think that it was going to be as deep as like FTX and Voyager and all these other ones. Um, but when all of those went down in the spring, it deepened it further than I thought it was going to deepen. And we're here for a while. You know, I don't think that we're going to like 5,000 Bitcoin or 10,000 Bitcoin or maybe even 12. Maybe we'll go back down to 15. But, um, but we're probably going to be here for a while. And, and we're going to be here for a while for macro factors. And we're going to be here until the until the equity markets catch up with us. Equity markets are still behind the digital asset markets. You know, we got here first because of those failures, and then we've had bigger failures with FTX, which again I didn't predict. You know, we can talk about FTX more, but I, I didn't predict that they were going to be a fraud. You know, um, thank God we didn't have any money with them. Um, and and now we've got the Genesis situation. Genesis situation I think is going to be bigger than FTX. But once that's out, I think we're gone. I mean, that's it. There's no more leverage out there. Well, as uh, Arthur said, we, uh, Arthur Hayes said, mm-hmm. like he said, oh, do you remember the article I found you? The He's, one earlier in like March last yeah, year. Yeah, he said, I, no, 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 recent one. He just said, uh, I think the market's bottom because everyone who's gone bankrupt, has, who can go bankrupt has gone bankrupt. <laughs> <laughs> like there's nothing left. Uh, obviously, we still have Genesis, but part of me thinks Genesis is priced in because everyone knows they're fucked. I mean, what are their options? They can raise more money, but is anyone going to lend them money? Is it worth just explaining this situation kind of from the start for anyone that doesn't know yeah, what's what, going what on? what can you explain about Genesis? Well, here's what I know, and here's what I think I know. There's, there's two different things, right? Um, and I didn't really, I guess I really didn't uncover a lot of this until the FTX bankruptcy. Um, I, I knew that BlockFi was, was heavily involved in Genesis, as was Three Arrows Capital. Um, But essentially what what was happening was BlockFi didn't have an other side of their market. So they were giving money to people like Three Arrows Capital, Genesis, um, who were then lending out and giving back a yield to Alameda, um, um, Three Arrows Capital once again. And the interesting thing about Alameda was my understanding, and this is based on a Coindesk article, so I don't know if it's true or not, that they had something like three and a half to four billion dollars in loans to three arrows at one point. Oh no, no, sorry, to Alameda at one point. Uh, something like two billion to three arrows capital. I mean, Genesis had these loans. Though. Yeah. So, so, and this is all just kind of, you know going back to a CoinDesk article, which you know we we don't know if it's right or not. But um, and then two and a half billion dollars of the loans that were out to Alameda were called in Q two. And that was, again, according to the same article. But they still had about a billion left. But, but we knew that BlockFi, as early as 2020, was involved in the uh, GBTC trade. So they were getting lending. They, they, were, they were taking some of their deposits, but they were also getting lending uh, to buy GBTC. They were holding it, selling it at a premium six months later, um, buying more. And that's how they were distributing their yield. And then other people caught on to Celsius, um, 
Celsius was doing that. We actually saw a filing this week that Celsius owns 35% of the entire Osprey Trust. I don't even know what Osprey Trust is. It's like a competitor to Grayscale. Okay. So, um, so we don't know if uh, you know how much they you know how much they have of GBTC, but but everybody was involved in this trade, and when it was trading at a premium, it was great. Everybody was making money, loans going around everywhere, more shares are being created. The minute it's dropped down to a, a discount, everybody got stuck in the trade. Because you got to hold for six months. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so so now you have all these companies that have now gone bankrupt because they, you know, they they've lost money. They can't pay the yield. Their their deposits are tied up. And they owe money to Genesis, but, th but they're in bankruptcy, you know, so you're not going to get that anytime soon. But then you have the other people that have deposits with Genesis, like Jim and I earn, for instance, $900 million in deposits that they can't get back right now because they can't pay them back. And that's just one entity. There's a lot. I, I understand that there's a lot of other entities that have very large deposits with Genesis that they were earning yield on that they can't get out either. Do we do we know what the size of the deposits that were with Genesis and what they actually have? We don't. Nobody knows. No. Huh. Did you read uh, Cameron's letter, public I, letter? I did. Yeah. I thought that was very interesting. That I mean, it it, it clearly laid out that you know they have nine hundred million dollars with with Genesis. That they're trying to get back. Um, that there's intercompany loans between DCG and Genesis, which is really interesting. Um, I thought it was really interesting for Cameron and Tyler to go public like that, to take it public like that. I do too. I'm glad they did, because like, let's have the conversation. Yeah. Um, and I saw them go back and forth with Barry. Uh, I mean, I don't know what the answer is. It's like I'm well out of my depth here, but it's um, it's a really scary situation because it how everyone seemed to be lending each other money, and it's almost like they were lending each other money and then using that or something else as collateral and lending something else. And it was just like a big, it was like a multi-company Ponzi scheme. Yeah, that's right. And, and if what, what I find is really interesting is, yeah, everybody was connected, but they were all connected through one group, Genesis. Genesis, yeah. So when you say they're in bankruptcy, what does that mean in terms, is that chapter 11? Well, it could be, it could be chapter 11. Um, that's 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 typically where most of these uh, companies are falling. They're falling into chapter eleven. And, and why would they do that? Does that give them a period of grace to try and figure it out? Well, in the case of FTX, um, they they put themselves there so that other so that they have a little bit of control. Uh, because if someone else puts you there, then you <coughs> then you lose some of the, that control. Um, so 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 very simply put. They, they did that to kind of protect themselves so that they could work out how they're going to pay all of their debts. And it might be 60 cents on the dollar, 80 cents on the dollar, 30, you know, we, we don't know what it is, but uh, it's for them to essentially restructure. And uh, that's, that's really the purpose of all of this, to, to, to restructure and figure out the legal way to do that because they're just so in debt, they, 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 they can't pay their bills anymore. Right, okay. Can you talk about the offer you've made? Sure. What could you tell me? Yeah, I'll leave. I'll let you lead, <laughs> like because it's public. Yeah, yeah, it's public. I can talk, I can talk about the offer. There's probably some things that I shouldn't say, and I'll I'll, I'll keep those keep, keep those off. But um, look, essentially, you know, we've um, you know we we launched a fund that is opportunistic in nature. You know, we were looking at a lot of different opportunities in the market when they presented themselves, and we we've just been kind of in a holding pattern since. I don't know. We were, we were going to launch it in January. We we're like, ah, eh, too soon. Celsius fell apart. We're like, mm, there's going to be another shoe to drop. So we waited. And we finally launched it in October because we think we're pretty close to a bottom right now. And we're just picking up things from either, either special situations or activist positions. And uh, one of the situations we identified was GBTC. We thought, okay, well, we're trading at a 47% discount right now. That, and, and at the time we looked at it you know, in a, in a very hard way, it was essentially buying Bitcoin at nine thousand. Okay, right, which is which is a pretty good deal. By the way, that's that's still the case. Buying buying Bitcoin at nine thousand. So, um, and the idea is, 
a few different things could happen. If, if an ETF is approved and it's converted, or if uh, redemptions are made to the trust, or if there's a tender offer, I mean, all of these things are in the realm of possibility, then you would essentially be buying Bitcoin at 9,000 and then getting it at six, 16, hmm. which is, you know, as long as Bitcoin stays at 16. Uh, and, and I think, I think it's still, it's fair that Bitcoin's you know, going to be in this range for a while. So, so we saw that opportunity and, and, um, and then when the FTX, and then a few weeks after FTX, we noticed that they were heavily involved in Alameda and FTX. We're like, oh, there might be something bigger going on here. And uh, so we started looking at more of an activist play, uh, thinking that, well, maybe they're not going to voluntarily open it up for redemptions. We don't think an ETF is going to get approved this year for Bitcoin. So what are going to be our options? Well, our options are is to try to you know, kindly convince them to open it up for redemptions, or at least to apply for redemptions, uh, and to give everybody their Bitcoin at, at value. Um, and then a group called Firtree uh, filed a lawsuit before we could kind of get to that point. And then we said, okay, great. I mean, we're, we're all for it. You know, they're getting information uh, through their, it's, a, it's an informational suit, their shareholders, they deserve it uh, under Delaware law. And that's good for everyone that holds GBTC, you know? So that's a step that we never have to take. And then we thought about it a little bit and saw that, you know, Jim and I was going after Genesis and all these other creditors are going after them. We're like, well, there could be a bankruptcy situation here. And if there's a bankruptcy and you've got DCG, Genesis and Grayscale all involved, that's not good for the shareholders of GBTC. So, we decided that we would simply put a proposal out there to all the shareholders of GBTC, you know, open letter saying that, look, you know, if we had a, you know, we should have a vote and we would be happy to take over the trust. We have experience running trust. We have experience running ETFs. We have experience running closed end funds as a team, not necessarily at Valkyrie, but, you know, in our past. Um, I've been involved in actually taking over a closed, a publicly traded closed in fund in my, you know, my previous job and, and then, and then managing it and managing, um, getting people their redemptions. So, you know, our, our team has, has a lot of experience here. Um, if something goes wrong, let's vote on us taking over a sponsor and getting people their redemptions. So the shareholders can vote for it to be moved under Valkyrie's management. They can do that. And DCG or Barry have no choice in that. If no. how, how does that even get organized? Well, what you have to do is gather enough votes so that you can demand a, a proxy vote. Okay. And uh, what's happened since, since we published our letter is other people have been organizing other people. <laughs> and uh, I don't, you know, David Bailey, for instance, has been out there organizing a grassroots campaign of gathering up all the people to that, that are shareholders of GBTC to say, hey, look, you know, let's let's organize here. Uh, Fir Tree um, filed their lawsuit. We're taking active position. We get phone calls. I mean, I'll, I was working on Christmas Eve. I mean, I probably had eight hours of phone calls on Christmas Eve. Damn of people calling us, like legitimate people that own shares of GBTC, say, how can we help? Yeah, so there's like, there's like multiple things happening here. There's the yeah. management of the uh, trust, but there's also that the, you believe that trade with the discount is a good trade because at some point that the owners of those shares will be able to redeem them for Bitcoin at some point. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. So yeah, I think, I think there's probably enough, I mean, look, there's probably enough people According to what David has collected, you know, and, you know, I'm not involved in what he's doing, but, you know, um, but I've, I see what he says. And um, according to what he's collected, it's probably 10% already, which is enough to affect a vote. Huh. So then there could be a vote to change a sponsor. And then, you know, if there's enough people that, that vote for it now, now, I think Grayscale would fight it tooth and nail. But how, um, how do you, f they fight it and they try and get people to vote against it? Yeah, they probably get people to vote against it. They probably say, "Well, you know, we don't have to. We don't have to hand it over," and it really would come down to a you know Delaware Chancery Court. So then, a bigger, wider question I have for you is that everything was going well for Bitcoin. The price was good. 
Tesla had bought some. Michael Saylor had bought most of it. Uh, lots of positive projects, investments, like everything was going well. And yes, the macro environment hasn't been great, but like we expect things like that. But the decisions of or the behavior of four or five institutions slash companies slash funds have really like fucked it up for everyone, right? Yeah. When you look at this and you consider the future of Bitcoin, like how do we stop this happening again? Like can we stop it happening again? Will people learn from this? I I hope so. I mean, look at all the pain we went through in, you know, at the end of 2017, 2018, you know, it's all, you know, jumbled in my head, right? You had all these like, you know, ICO projects that were coming out that were complete scams and they were, you know, pumping up the price of everything because everybody was getting excited about it. And then it all came crashing down, right? Um, and, and by the way, people, people yell at the maxis. I mean, I, I don't consider myself a maxi. I, I, I consider myself a Bitcoin only as a as digital currency, you know. Um, I like all technologies, but but as far as Bitcoin goes, I'm you know I'm like this is this is going to be the digital currency in my opinion, mm -hmm. right? Everything else is something different. Um, but I appreciate these people that are that are the loud maxis because they remembered what happened in the ICO scams, and they're out there trying to protect this ecosystem. So yeah, I absolutely appreciate them. They, they get annoying. <laughs> but 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 I love them. You know what I mean? Like uh, they're 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 doing what they think is right, and they're and, and they're and they're and they're they are protecting the newbies, right? So what's happened in in this particular cycle is a ton of leverage was created to pump the price. I mean, sixty nine thousand wasn't the right price for Bitcoin. That was a pumped, over levered price, and and I think in this last cycle, I was. I was pretty vocal on it, on a lot of the leverage. Um, Caitlin Long, uh, there was a few other people that, you know, that came from banking, like, you know, banking Wall Street, like, like Caitlin and I did, that were like saying, this is a problem. You know, we, you know and, and every chance we could, we would talk about, okay, you know, let's, let's find out how they're making yield. Let's find out how Celsius is making yield. And they never would, they never would say. And we told people to avoid those platforms, you know? And, um, and we avoided them. You know, anybody that was trying to produce, you know, an, a massive amount of leverage, we were we were avoiding them. And uh, I I hope that people will speak up in the next cycle. You know, Bitcoin goes in four year cycles based on having. And I'm sure two years from now, when everything is fine again and prices go up again, uh, people are going to get excited. They're going to get greedy, and they're going to pump things up on leverage. And I hope people remember this point in time and say, okay, stop, cut it out. You know, let's, uh, you know, and by the way, leverage isn't bad. Over leverage is bad. Yeah. And you can't really stop leverage, right? No, you can't. Do, do you think, um, I mean, how do you buy a car without leverage? How do you buy a house without leverage? Yeah. Right. Do you think, um, do you think there can be a market for borrowing and lending with Bitcoin? Yes. It can work. Yeah. Yeah. There just has to be a two-sided market, and it's not going to be these ridiculous yields that we're seeing, right? I think there's a market out there where somebody has Bitcoin that they, you know, that they, that they collateralize because they need to buy something, right? I mean, I mean, that's really how I see it, right? If I'm holding my Bitcoin and I don't want to have to sell it and pay taxes when I sell it, I can collateralize it to borrow some dollars to buy a car, buy a house, something like that. And that's fine. You know, I mean, there's a reasonable, you know, a reasonable interest rate that you would pay on that. And then there's a reasonable rate that somebody else would, would borrow against it. Right. I mean, it happens all the time. And I think as the ecosystem grows, there's going to be a reasonable, you know, lending market there, but it has to be two sides. It can't just be some pop-up, you know, lending platform. Our, our marketplace that's one-sided and have to go find, you know, go, go, go find people to run a hedge fund with your money. Like that's not the proper way of running, you know, of, of offering leverage. Do you think that perhaps the market isn't mature enough for it at the moment and that's why it happened? It, it's, yeah, it's not mature enough for it. I mean, that's, this is how banks work, Yeah. right? When you put money in a bank, the money's just not sitting there. The money is used to lend people money to buy houses and cars. It's really simple. You know, and there's due diligence done on the people, and sometimes they get over leveraged and blow up, and things things go wrong. But generally, 
those generally banks work out, you know, until they get into exotic instruments like they did in, you know, 05 through 07. Hmm. Okay, back to your crystal ball, which I should have listened to. Danny and I should have listened to when you sat there and told us. Uh, I'm going to ask you what your outlook is for the year. Like, you don't have to give me a definite answer, but like, what are the range of things that you're thinking about looking at on the macro environment? Because we are so correlated mm-hmm. to the macro environment. Yeah, I think from a from a macro perspective, you know, and I'm going to talk specifically to the U.S. Um, because a lot of other markets follow it. But in the U.S., um, the Fed is going to raise rates at least 100 basis points more. Uh, inflation is still a factor, despite a lot of people saying that we're... 100 basis points is 1%? Yeah, another, another 1%. Yeah, okay. Could be 150, could be, t- could be 200 basis points. What's the current rate? Uh, what is it, 475? Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so it's... Um, that's going to make a tough environment because companies that have corporate debt are having to borrow now at a higher price, which means their debt surface is higher, uh, especially high yield bond issuing companies, so junk bonds. And those companies can barely make their debt service as it is, but if rates go higher, it's going to be a lot tougher. Um, and then you're going to have a lot of situations like Toys R Us and Sears and you know some of these other ones that we remember in the last 10 years. But um, but it's going to be very difficult for these for, for, for these companies to buy commodities, produce something, sell goods, and pay high rates to just keep their companies operational. And a lot of these companies should have failed in the last ten years anyway. But low rates kept them alive, which is why we we've been producing a lot of junk into the market and people have overconsumed. Uh, so so I think that starts going away. Some of those companies start going away causes equity markets to go down. So potentially double digit default rates in corporate bonds um, over the next 18 months. When you say double digit default rates, what do you mean by double digit default rates? Like 12% of all junk bonds default. So what does that actually mean? Like 12% companies or 12% of the economy? Well, 12% of all the companies that issue junk bonds. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Why do people buy something called a junk bond? If it's junk, <laughs> well, it's not really junk. Okay. It's um, we, you know, I, I I came from the um, you know, from the fixed income you know bond world, and we call it high yield because it yields a little higher, <laughs> but it's more high risk. It's higher risk. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, what is the impact of of that? Well, oddly enough, the high yield bond market is highly correlated to the S and P. Okay. And a lot of people don't realize that, but um, because a lot of those companies are either in the S&P or have relationships with companies in the S&P. So if you get to say, we'll just call it, we'll be conservative, say eight to 12% default rates and in, in high, yield bond com- high yield bond issuing companies, um, that means the S&P could drop. That means liquidity comes out of the system and liquidity is already coming out of the system with rates going up. The S&P could drop another 20%. It's already down 20% over the last year. Mm-hmm. So we're pro- probably talking another 20%. And by the way, the Fed doesn't care. The Fed doesn't care if the S and P goes down twenty percent. They don't care if uh, if corporate defaults are high. They care about two things: inflation, inflation and unemployment. Right. But in trying to reduce inflation, they're going to raise unemployment, or do the jobs just migrate to other jobs? Well, that's kind of what's happening right now is we have a lot of open jobs, but it's mostly in the service sector and in the manufacturing sector um, and or in the farming sector, right? People don't want to work those jobs. People want to work at, you know, Twitter and, you know, drink mimosas in the morning, work for a couple hours on a bean bag and, you know, go to early lunch with their friends and go, go for the rest of the day. I mean, I, I don't know if you saw all those videos. I did see those videos. They're amazing. Like, to the point where I almost thought, uh, is this real? Yeah. Like, when they talk through their day, I got to, I, I, like, have you seen these videos? No. It's like, I got to work and I got myself a green tea mocha thingy with a vegan almond brownie. <laughs> and then I sat up my, and went to my pod and had a meeting. And then I went for lunch at this place. And then I went for dinner and had mimosas. And then we went to this place and went dancing. It's like the most, it, like it looks, to, uh, to me, it looked like it was satire. 
but it's not. It's not satire. And, and these, these I don't know who produced this. Somebody, somebody is telling their day on TikTok or some bullshit. Okay. I, I actually think that it wasn't, I actually think that the companies were producing this because they were trying to hire people and they're like, look how great it is working here. Look how great it yeah. is to work at LinkedIn. You do no work, <laughs> you eat and drink all day, and then you get drunk in the evening. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's like, like our job. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm five days, five days no beer. But, but, but that is, I mean, I mean, it sounds crazy, but like people, people couldn't find enough. I mean, there weren't enough people to hire and they needed bodies and they couldn't overwork people because people would just leave. So they're like, all right, fine. You know, we'll give you, you can work four hours a day and do whatever the hell you want. And we just, we just need bodies to do a couple of things, but that's all gone now. I mean, companies now they can't are, find enough people to fire. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> but I know the fed like a mandate to keep unemployment low, but aren't they doing like everything at the moment to do the opposite? Well, their mandate is to have stable employment at a, at a, at a low rate, but right now unemployment's too low, okay? So three and a half percent is too low. 5% is, is, I would say that's a fully employed system because, I mean, just, just think about, just think about society, okay? 5% of the population are unemployable. Yeah. I mean, it's just basic behavioral science. So when you have three and a half percent unemployment, that means one and a half percent of the workforce is just completely unemployable. You're fucking idiots. Yeah. And then you can't hire anybody because nobody wants to leave their, you know, the jobs that they have. So you need to crush demand to get that one and a half percent out of work. That's exactly right. Right. Hmm. So, so when you hear about demand destruction, you think that sounds like fucking idiotic. Why would you want demand destruction? But actually there's a logic to it. Well, there, there is, and here's the logic, okay. We had a good 10 years after the financial crisis where we had easy monetary policy, but inflation was pretty muted. The reason why was wage growth. So, so, so wage inflation, wage growth is what drives inflation. And everybody said, well, inflation's coming, inflation's coming. Like, no, not until wages grow. But then we started having less and less employees for the jobs that we needed because inflation was low and because we had easy monetary policy. And then all of a sudden inflation crashes because people are getting 10% more, 10% more a year uh, because they're, they're, they can't find people, you know, they can't find people to work. Right, so are you saying that inflation comes from wage growth? Yeah, it's, well, it's one of the things it comes from, but yeah, yeah. But yeah. Huh, okay, so basically you're saying the good times are over. Yes. Now we're into doing a, a bit of a reset, a necessary reset. Mm -hmm. um, and you think those interest rates will stay high for how long? Well, I think they go up and stay up for at least the next year. Okay. So that's a problem for the government. Yes. Because they're having to pay high interest on their bonds and their debt. That's right. And so what can the government do about that? Because that's... They've got a lot of fucking debt. It's like in the UK, we've got a lot of debt. Well, here's, here's, where, here's the breaking point. You, you nailed it. Yeah. Okay, absolutely nailed. This is where the breaking point comes. Inflation's not going away. Unemployment's not going away. The US just passed a $1.7 trillion omnibus bill. That means stimulus. That means they're driving inflation while the Fed's trying to control it. A lot of that stimulus is also creating jobs. I saw that. You're going to build bridges. <laughs> That's right. Biden's going to build bridges. But is that in preparation for the 12% uh, destruction? No. Oh, it's not. No. This is just, I don't even know what this is. <laughs> this is just pork barrel spending. And when does this start? So, well, it's, it starts this year, right? So, so you've got all this money that needs to be processed in the system free money, more jobs, higher inflation, while the Fed is trying to lower jobs or, or increase the jobless, the jobless rate and lower inflation. So the two are at odds right now. The nice thing about having Republicans control the House again, right? And I'm not a Republican or a Democrat. I care less about either one of them. But I like, I like stalemate in government because that means no more spending, no more, no more bad policy making, you know? I mean, I, I, 
you know, in the, in the US, it's good when no one's in control, you know, and, and there's chaos. I actually like the fact that right now they can't decide on a house speaker. That means they can't get anything done. That means they can't do anything to mess anything else up. Yeah, again, ex <laughs> explain that to me because I've seen like, who's this guy, McCarthy, McCartney, who they tr thought would be the house speaker, yeah. and then he didn't get it. Like, what's going on here? Explain this to us as a Brit. As a Brit, it, it looks very similar to parliament. Okay. okay, so parliament has all these factions and they yeah. try to form a government <laughs> and your government's not formed until you have your parliamentary. Until, until that person is, until the prime minister is elected then they can't do anything. So okay. there's no government that can do anything. Same kind of thing with the House. No laws can be passed until the Speaker of the House is actually chosen. Why can't they agree a Speaker of the House? Though? Well, there's a small faction of the Republican Party of about 20 people that are, most of them are newly elected. And they're kind of, I would say, I would call them anti-government establishment. Interesting. And they're saying, look, we don't want somebody from the establishment that's been a sitting politician for a long period of time that's passed all these laws that have increased spending, um, given away money, like all the problems that we see coming. I mean, by the way, I kind of agree with them. It's oh, like, no. <laughs> I, I, but I always think new, I always think uh, green politicians, when I say green, new, not as in uh, the environment, uh, these kind of green politicians come in with good intentions, realize they can't make change, and just become part of the system. Look, AOC, okay. I yeah. was a massive fan of AOC in the beginning. I mean, she, by the way, I agree with probably like maybe less than 10% of her policies. But she's radical. And she but she's radical. Yeah, she, she has a pop, right? She'll stand up and say things to people. That's right. Yeah. The, the purpose of the House of Representatives is to represent the American people. And she represents a demographic. Yeah. She deserves to be there all day long. And uh, there's this other woman, what's her name? She's She's, she's one of the, loud Republicans right now that's that's voting against McCarthy, Bobel. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm botching her name. She's, she's, a, she's a congresswoman from um, uh, Colorado. She's, she's basically the AOC of the Republican Party. Okay. Like she's loud, she's obnoxious. And, but, but her voice deserves to be heard because she represents a part of the demographic. Okay, and Lauren. that's what I love. Lauren. Yeah, that's right. And that's what I love about that's what I love about what the House of Representatives is supposed to be. And when AOC came on, she went up against this establishment politician that, that didn't care about his, his constituents. And she ran a grassroots movement, got him out, and she was loud, and she opposed her party. She opposed the establishment, and now she's the establishment. Yeah, she's definitely the establishment. Yeah. I saw one of those, um, she was like in a town hall meeting, and they were calling out her out on voting, or what she was voting for. Uh, and I also found that whole kind of tax the rich dress kind of bullshit. Yeah. Um, and I just feel like that's what happens. People just go in, they want to make change. Yeah. They, they become can't. they become rich and they don't want to tax the rich anymore. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> they don't want to tax the rich anymore. Um, fine. So you're you're hoping for deadlock. I love deadlock and I love deadlock in government. But um, so so I don't believe any more of these big spending bills are going to be passed because there's definitely a big enough constituency in the, in the House that's gonna block it. So without the House passing anything, you know, I think, I think we're gonna be in good shape. I think, I think we can finally work out of the system all the other bills that were passed. And now we just gotta decrease the government budget. It's no more money for Ukraine. Yeah. Well, you say that, I mean, we had the conversation yesterday with Matthew Pines. Mm -hmm. Do you know Matthew? No. He's part of uh, BPI. Um, really interesting guy. And he was talking about the main, the big issue that the government have is the amount of things they have to finance about. They've got a service debt. They have to keep investing in the military because China's growing their military. Mm -hmm. They can't afford the bond market to collapse, but you've got China and Russia exiting from the dollar and trying to create alternatives. Um, they've got a you've got massive social security uh, liabilities. He was saying, "I, you know, what are you going to cut? Yeah, like where are you going to cut? You got a six? Was it what is it, tax receipts six trillion in the US ish? Yeah, I like get one trillion to the uh, to the military. You've got you know how, where where does the cut come? Well, so so this kind of goes back to government spending versus Fed policy right now, yeah. and they're at odds. 
in order to fund government spending, you have to issue bonds. But the Fed's not buying bonds right now. They're not adding to their balance sheet and interest rates are going up. So, so that's kind of the, the, the silver bullet, so to speak, right? Because the, the one thing, if, if inflation and unemployment's not gonna change, the one thing that could cause the Fed to change course is a failed treasury auction, which means that you've gotta issue all this debt to pay for the things that you wanna pay for, that you've already passed laws to pay for, and it costs more to do it because of the higher interest rate. And there's nobody to buy the bonds. Which is similar to what happened in the UK. It's exactly what happened in the UK. Hmm. And you think that's likely? I think it's extremely likely. So then the Fed has to step in and backstop. That's right. That's right. And then what does that mean? Well, that means that, yeah, everybody's at capacity. They can't buy any more of these bonds. And uh, the, the Fed has to step in and say, okay, fine. We'll start buying bonds to our balance sheet. When that happens, they've just injected liquidity in the system. And now we just kind of go right back out. The party, they, party starts again? Yeah, that's right. Get back on our beanbags with mm -hmm. our mockers. Yeah, that's a pivot, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that would mean that the, is it the primary dealers that, that buy the bonds? Yeah, that's right. So people like JP Morgan or whoever. I mean, yeah, there's there's dealers out there that are the they're they're the primary dealers. I mean, one of the one of the biggest um, dealers in U.S. Treasuries is actually uh, Jump, and um, and then their issue and then they're they're kind of dealing it and selling it out to uh, a lot a lot of the large asset managers, um, governments. I mean, China used to be a big buyer of bonds. They're they're not anymore. I mean, they're they're holding steady. I mean, other governments around the world have to buy U.S. Treasuries to peg their currency to the US dollar. So, so for instance, the, the US loves to call China a currency manipulator. Well, they also love China to buy their bonds. And that's how they manipulate the currency, by buying US treasuries. But for those primary, do they have to buy bonds? Do they have to turn up to the market like JP Morgan or Goldman or whoever? They don't. They don't. So if there's no demand from the other side, they will just not, or they'll just not bid. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that, that, that's what's called a failed auction. So is that, do we want this? <laughs> <laughs> kind of. <laughs> Just because we want the party back. We want the party back, yeah. <laughs> um, I'll tell you what we really want. What we really want, I mean, this is, this is the most sensible thing that could happen. It's never going to happen. So this is the second best thing, is for our government to restrict spending to create a budget that is balanced. You, and fu you fucking crazy? I am crazy. <laughs> That'll uh, never happen. I live in a dream world. We, uh, I brought this up a few times. We interviewed a guy called Dan Tubb recently, King Bingo on Twitter in the uh, UK, and we were talking about why the government can't, our government can't get out of the situation they're in. Uh, tax receipts are about a trillion in the UK. Spending's about 1.15. So basically, they're increasing debt by about 100, 150 billion a year. Mm -hmm. And we went through like uh, an exercise of saying, well, if you if you just wanted to uh, be at break even point, you kind of need to take it. It was about 120 billion, so you're not increasing your debt. But if you want to pay it off, because the debt itself is like two and a half trillion, if you want to pay it off over 20 years, you actually need to take 240 billion out of the budget, yeah. out of the spend. As so we went through the exercise, like where are you going to take it from? Okay, what's your number one spend? Number one spend is the NHS. Which is about that 240 billion. It's 200 billion. Yeah. But he did say a large part of that is um, depreciation write offs. But anyway, 200 billion. Now, nobody is going to get rid of the NHS in the UK. Mm. They're always just going to increase spending on it because it's a yeah. political yeah, weapon. The second biggest thing is uh, servicing debt, which is 120 billion. Well, you can't get rid of that. That's right. You know, so we were going through the list and it was like, where, where what do you cut? Where do you cut 240 billion from it? Now, look, you can, because what you do do, you can do is go and make privatize half of the NHS, you know, cut the budget for that in half. You know, there are other areas to cut it out, but there's no political popular decision here. Mm. Nobody is going to get voted in and says, by the way, we're going to cut our budget by a quarter. That means, you know, your pensions have been halved. The NHS is paid for if you earn over 20,000 a year. There is no free bus passes for OAPs, like all the shit that they can cut, they're not going to cut it. So it's like what you're saying, I get it. Yeah. 
I mean, here in the U.S., it's like, okay, military spending. Well, you know, the military complex is going to let that happen. Nope. Right? Um, pensions. Um, federal employees. I mean, yeah, you go down the list. No, 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 that's going to happen. The best thing you can do is pause. Yeah. And that's, that's what's going to happen for the next two years. We're going to have a pause. Yeah, one thing I was thinking about, Danny, you know, in the last interview we just did with Josh, was it Hendrickson? Hendrickson, yeah. Do you know Josh? Mm-hmm. Um, he's just an economist professor, teaches at the uh, state of Mississippi. Ole Miss. Uh, Ole Miss. Huh. Um, Another BPI guy. Yeah, he was saying to me, he was explaining the problem. He said, the problem is, is that governments used to, at time of war, they'd have to borrow a lot more money. But like after a war, that spend, that massive spend on military would be cut. So their tax receipts would be able to be increased to pay off the debt. It was a very simple thing. He said, the problem is governments have essentially become massive insurance companies providing you know, Medicare or Social Security or welfare, all these different insurance products, which essentially disincentivize people to go out and work and be productive. He was saying like, like that's the primary issue. It's like the issue in the UK, what do you cut? My only thing I can th- think and I might be being completely naive here, but like we have to find a way of weaning ourselves off these massive government insurance That's right. products. How do you do that? Do you, do you borrow a massive amount now and you say, okay, anyone who's under 30, state pensions are gone. You've got to start preparing now. Um, uh, anyone who earns over 50,000 a year has got to pay for their health care. And then in 10 years, it'll be 40,000. Like, can you borrow a massive amount and wean yourself off? Is that a logical way to do this? No. No? Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I look, I sound very smart then. Well, here's the problem, right? I mean, whether you're a governor of a state or the president of the United States, um, you, you have term limits. Okay, so... Oh, no, I, no, no. But you, you, you're saying it's not going to happen. Are you saying it, it wouldn't work? Or are you saying it's not going to happen because of the political cycle? Oh, it would never work. I mean, no, no, it would work, but it would never happen. Yeah, that's, that's a difference. So yeah, I'm not a complete yeah. dumbass. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, but it, it would never happen. But, but it goes back to term limits. So, you know, we should be putting term limits on Congress, Senate. You know, there's, there's people that have been there way too long. Yeah. Right. Way dug in. But the, the flip side of that, the problem with term limits for, for governors and, and, and presidents is that if, if you're only there for eight years, you can issue as many 10-year... 15, 20 year bonds, 30 year bonds that you want to do things to make yourself look good and let the next guy worry about it. Yeah. And that's always the attitude. It's like, no, I'm going to spend as much money as I can to make myself, to, to give myself a legacy and then let the next guy worry about how they're going to pay for it. Yeah. I, I, I mentioned this thing before. I kind of feel like government should manage a budget. Yes. And if you want to borrow outside of the government's budget, then that should be forced to a national election. Okay, okay. this government has been in power two years. Um, they want to borrow this much money for this reason. That forces a general election. So the public get to decide. That's right. So the public are forced to educate themselves on why this is a bad idea. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. I mean, I'm full of naive ideas, by the way. It's, it's not that naive because in California, one of the things that I liked about California, I disliked most things, but anytime that you wanted to issue a bond and spend money, you had to put it to a general election huh. and people got to vote on it. I think, I feel like a lot of people really don't understand how it all works as well. Um, you know, when they, whenever there's any problems, you can see friends or family complain about this Well, the government should pay for this. Like they do have this endless pot of money. They do, but they don't understand this endless pot of, pot of money has implications. That's right. Oh man. All right, Steve, listen, <laughs> <laughs> let's finish on. I'm not sure it's a positive note, but like anyone listening going, oh, okay, this sounds like bullshit. How, how would you advise people, without giving financial advice, how would you advise people to prepare or think about the next year, two years? So when it, when it comes to the world of, of Bitcoin over the next year, I, I actually believe that even though I think the equity markets are going down, recession is already here, it's going to get worse. Um, Bitcoin's probably in a bottom range right now. So... Um, you know, I don't think we go up anytime soon. Maybe not until, you know, Q4, maybe Q1 of next year. But um, but we're we're at the bottom. So uh, that's a positive note. <laughs> Stock size. <laughs>
<laughs> like it can't get any worse for Bitcoin. <laughs> um, stocks will go down. Uh, you know, stocks have to catch up with Bitcoin because yeah. we 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 came we we kind of came down, um, you know, in an exasperated way, and, and stocks are just just now catching up. But no, we're at the bottom. What That's do you good. think about housing? Ooh. The pit, housing is very regional right now. Um, there are some areas like Austin, for instance, where um, housing housing prices are starting to drop. You know, and this is like a very popular city. Um, but they went up really quick. They went really quick. It, yeah. It's revision. People are people are worried about it, but all it is is a reversion to the mean. Yeah. Right. I mean, we're not talking about we're going below what it was two years ago. We're just coming back down to earth a little bit. Yeah. And that's perfectly fine. Um, but yeah, housing prices, um, I, I, I do believe home sales are slowing down dramatically. People can't afford mortgages at this rate. Yeah. You know? Uh, so, so yeah, it, it's going to be a reversion to the mean. Some areas are going to s- stand pretty strong. Some areas are going to just kind of really fall flat. It just all depends. Hmm. All right. Well, listen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck, man. You can tell we're going to get Steve in and make us all miserable. <laughs> it's not that nah, bad. Steve, nah, it isn't. Like, it, look, we, we need to reset. It's obviously everything stupid. One of the interesting things, I got an email from my bank this week hmm. saying, uh, good news, your um, your savings will now get 2.5% interest. Yeah. Well, let's let's temper this. With 10% inflation in the UK, I'm still losing. losing. But the idea of getting interest, uh, a meaningful interest, because it, it was like 0.1% when I opened the account, right? To a two and a half percent is great. I think the trend is right. The trajectory is right. I don't actually myself want us to get back to these zero percent interest rates or one percent interest rates because I think they drive wealth inequality mm. in a bad way. I think this should be a cost of borrowing capital. I don't know what that cost should be. I, I you know, a five percent interest rate when you're buying a house doesn't sound crazy. Mm-mm. And like my dad, he was like, yeah, like. Historically, I used to pay that. That's right. It's we're not conditioned to it. Yeah. I mean, my parents paid 12% when they bought a house in the 80s. There you go. Right. So, like, I feel like we're resetting. I just worry we go back to the kind of crazy bullshit of cheap credit. And I hope we don't. Yeah. Is it inevitable, though, that we end up back at basically 0% interest? I think it's going to be hard for us to get there anytime soon. Um, I, I, I truly believe that. When there's when there's a pivot, and it'll probably be due to a failed treasury auction, the Fed will buy assets to the balance sheet, but the rates will remain high. Uh, I, I can't imagine I can't imagine Fed dropping rates below say three percent in the short run, and or even you know in the next few years. Hmm. I, th- I think I think it stays high, and, and we just we just increase the size of the balance sheet. All right, man. Listen, do you want anyone to go and read anything, see anything, follow anything? Should we send people anywhere? I don't know. Where, where should we send people? I mean, I don't know. Do you want us to go and read your offer? I've, I've got, I've got a really good one for you to read. Okay. Okay. This will, this will blow your mind. Um, just because my my background is in behavioral economics. Um, Caroline, you know, Alameda Caroline's dad is a behavioral economics professor at MIT. In the 90s, he wrote a paper on um, the prisoner's dilemma. Go read that paper. Go look it up. Read it because it's exactly the same principles that she followed in turning in SBF. You'll find it fascinating. Huh. I want you to tell us more. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to pause right there and let you read it. All right, man. Listen, we'll go and read it. Steve, good to see you as always. Good to see Love you. Love coming to Nashville. Love hanging out. Thank you, man. Absolutely.